After the break, we provide a rare glimpse of the haunted imagination of Pakistani painter Tasadduk Sohail. Strange creatures and images escape from Sohail's unconscious. The faces that appear in his anti-religious icons are more recognizable. Recognition has been slow in coming. Sohail has lived and worked in this small bedsitter for over 20 years. Even as he sits and paints, the past torments him. The bloodshed he witnessed 40 years ago when India was partitioned continues to haunt him. It happened when I was 14 or 15 years old and living in Jalandhar in an 8th or ninth class. I was studying in those days. And uh, I used to pass through, it was a mixed kind of society. You see in Jalandhar there were Sikhs living there, Hindus living there, Mohammedans living there. And they were all together. It was like a big family and uh, we, we all loved each other and all kind of, I played with big boys, with Hindu boys played with me and all kind of thing. Then all of a sudden the partition came and it made everybody against each other. Those mosques which used to give the love, you know, I used to think the love coming out of those mandars and gurdwaras and everything. After the partition, people came out with daggers from there, with birches from there, with knives from there, and killed each other. Hindu killed Muslims, Muslim killed Sikhs, Sikh killed Muslims and everything. So that have stayed in my mind. And uh, after that, I have never felt the same again. I went totally against religion because I thought if it was not the religion, we would have been one. It's the religion which divides us, which tells us, but to live separate, cut countries into parts because of religion, you see? So that is the reason. And that's, these things are gone in my subconscious, and when I start drawing now, they come out. The paintings you draw about mullahs with their aggressive sexual organs have been termed erotic. Yet there is something more to them, isn't there? Because it's like two fingers salute to the religious people. You see? That's uh, because my language is art. How can I give that two fingers salute to them? So that's, how, that's why. Because uh, I know these people get excited of these kind of things, which they don't, don't do it here, but they want to do in heaven. In heaven they want eight women. Here they don't like to see a woman, you know. In heaven, if you read them, their things, women will be lying around nude, walking in the nude. There will be women with every man everywhere, and uh, canals of honey and this kind of things will be flowing, milk and everything. It's everything here. They don't want it here, these religious people. They want after death. After death, there is nothing. You are dead. Once you are dead, you are bloody well dead. It's not only the mullahs I paint like that. I paint all the religious people like that, you know, all these priests, Christian priests, Jewish priests, Hindu priests, and Buddhist priests. All the priests I paint in my drawings is a male figure is a priest. So, it has, I didn't create it, him like this. It has become itself, in my mind, some kind of a strange thing, which live in a fantastic world of its own. And it, as living in the future, I mean, after death kind of thing, you see. So those kind of things is a hypocritical figure. I'm attacking all kind of religious societies, because they're hypocritical. So they say something, they do something. So if they say, our, they all say our religion says, we are all brothers. Why you want divisions? 
Why you say we are the only chosen ones? Every religion says we love uh, in front of Allah, we are all one. But every religion says you are the best one. So the, that's not. When you went to Pakistan recently, you had some exhibitions. Did you show all your paintings? No, I couldn't. They would, come, would have killed me. How can I show that? That's why I'm here. Because they, they only show my fully dressed figures or animals or landscapes, which I hate to paint. You see, I, I mean, animals I like to paint, but landscapes and all kind of things, which are not me. So then uh, that's why I don't stay there, because I, if you don't show my real work, it's no good for me, no good for even them, because you don't understand what I am. But were there not some art critics to whom you showed them privately? I showed them privately. They all want to have it. At the back, they all want to buy it. They bought it. Under the counter. Under the counter. Under the counter, they bought it. All of them. Everybody, not only the men. Women bought them. Begumad bought them. So they said that uh, this uh, liquor is banned there. How much liquor you want? It's flowing like water there. Everybody is drinking. It's only they catch it. After two months, they catch one poor bugger and lash him. But rest of them drink. How do you survive? How do you live from day to day? Even now, I'm, I'm on the door. You see, I go and find a job. And recently, uh, I, I mean, uh, any job, I told them to give me any job, not some special job, just any job, part-time job, full-time job, but people don't give me job because the moment they hear that I'm 57, they say, they, even the job, people, job center people laugh at me. So they push me aside, you know. What sort of jobs do you apply for? I applied for this part-time shelf filler, full-time supermarket somebody to do anything. I applied to Mark and Spencer, Waitrose, every shop, every big, uh, big shop, small shop or anything. So they have one, one job which we don't do in Pakistan and India, Indian people most usually don't do, is the loo attendant. I even apply for that, and I've been rejected. You've been rejected as a loo attendant? Yeah. Where? In the, uh, it's a, near Portobello Road. There is some sporting center. They have a small loo and a sporting, uh, some grounds and all kind of thing. So I applied them, and they told me that they don't want me. They want a young person. Even for that, they want a young person. When did you s actually start to paint? What drove you to it? Oh, uh, that is another story. You see, because after three years, four years here, uh, and uh, I couldn't find any girlfriends and anything. First thing, I had, didn't have much money. Then the sy whole system was different than ours, you know. In our work, a man is shy, boy shy, you know, the girls like him. But here, they say he's a stupid man. Somebody, you know, the, as, uh, until you go and approach them. And I couldn't do it because I thought it was rude. But that was the thing going. So I said, what to do now? How should I find a girlfriend? So I was looking around and all kind of things. All of a sudden, I passed near on the Charing Cross, St. Martin School of Art. I saw a lot of girls going in there. I said, that's a girl's nest or something. So I said, and the, there was a queue outside. They said, uh, I said, what's this queue for? They said, they're taking admission in art college. I said, can I take admission in art college? They said, yeah, in evening, evening classes. So I enrolled myself in there. So that was only to meet the girls and see the nude model every day. Because it was costing me a lot of money in the striptease club when I was going there. It was costing one pound fifty each time. So this time, it was here, it was three pounds for three months. That was cheaper. So I said, that's a good idea. So I started going there and drawing there. So, but it uh, gradually grew on me. So I forgot about the model and started drawing and painting and everything. That's how I started. Sex is a very prominent feature in some of your satirical drawings. I symbolize woman, a life, symbol of life. And all my pre, all the figure, male figure in my painting is a priest, padres, 
and uh, mullahs. mullahs and and they are, what do you call it, uh, Jewish priest and some Buddhist priest, but they are always priests. Sometimes with beard, sometimes with little hair and the back and everything. There is never an uh, ordinary man in there. And they are messing about with that young woman, which is always young, uh, and they try to mess, they're messing about with their life, which they don't know anything about. So, I, I symbol, in symbols, I satirize those things, uh, moral and social values of these societies and all kind of things. How do you explain th these, these paintings, that the model for them, the colors? I took Picasso his loin drawings, his flowing line. I took from Ruel his strength. I took from German artists their strength and their wild things, which I wanted. I didn't take anything from English artists because there, was, there is none. I didn't like anyone. I liked Turner, but his wildness and his strength started from the sea and finished it in the sea. So it didn't appeal me very much. I'm very sorry about that. Have you never applied for a grant to paint from anybody, the Arts Council, the Greater London Arts Council? No. You've never applied? No. Why? I, uh, because I don't know how to go around these kind of things. I never applied for that. No. How do you find the atmosphere in this particular locality? Because we're, as we sit in this room, it's a totally different world. It's your world. It's on the walls, it's in your head, it's in the way you live. Yet you go outside and it's a sort of genteel part of North London. It's a Jewish area, you see, when I came here 24 years <coughs> before, uh, um, uh, it was full of Jewish people. No, even some of them are gone, but there are still Jewish people living around here. I like the beards, big, big, long beards and robes, you know, I like them. So all these robes and beard comes from them because it gives me two kind of things, living models all around me. I use them as mullahs as well. And I use them as Jewish as well, you know, see. So they are the same religion, they come from the same place. So this is a colorfulness, and uh, that's, that helps a bit. And it's a very quiet area. And, uh, you know, I never usually go out of my room because I can't afford. So I sit all the time in my room with my cats, and that's how I pass my day. Now, increasingly now, as you begin to get exhibitions, do you think that this will affect the way you live or your style? I hope not, because uh, up till now I've seen artists who become famous. The fame kills them, usually. Their works deteriorate, and uh, which I don't like. I want to stay as I am. We asked art critic Richard Cork to assess Sohail's work. The thing that struck me most forcibly about these little drawings was that Sir Hale seemed to have created a whole world for himself, which was very much his own world. Um, and it was a world that is peopled by figures who seem to have suffered enormously. Uh, they seem to have been buffeted by many of the winds that have blown across the 20th century. Um, although I say the 20th century, I mean, one of the curious things about these images is they don't refer specifically to the modern world. Far from it. Uh, they seem really to reach back to some sort of mythical region. Um, you seem to be inhabiting a forest world very often where the trees rise up very strangely to blot out the sky. And it's only with difficulty that within the shadowy regions of these forests you discover figures lying very often, writhing sometimes, um, on many occasions heaped up. So you get the feeling almost of a charnel house at times. They're quite gruesome, some of them. And he doesn't pull his punches, Sir Hale. Um, he seems to be taking upon himself the duty to insist that there's been an awful lot of human tragedy during the 20th century. I suppose the first thing that strikes me is that within the compass of what is, after all, a very small drawing, um, he has, in fact, able to uh, pack in an extraordinary microcosm. A whole sort of world is there. Um, I'm looking at this 
uh, dark, cavernous scene where uh, gnarled roots of trees seem to be growing up. Um, and in the shadows at the bottom, there, is the, there are these heads, these skulls. Um, some of them seem to be quite dead. Others have a kind of curious, almost paradoxical life about them. Bearded faces seem to be cackling, almost as if they, they know they're down there and they're enjoying the, <laughs> the sheer dreadfulness of the region that they inhabit. The sexual pictures represent um, human figures, male human figures, of course, at their most rampant. Um, they seem to be very much in control of their own destinies and their own fantasy world, indeed. They seem to enjoy romping around these little picture spaces that Sahel gives them. Um, and I think that's where the whole other side of his temperament comes out, which is the humour. Uh, you don't really detect that in the tragic drawings at all. But in these erotic pictures, you get another side to him. This, this, this wry, rather mordant wit comes through. And it's clearly very subversive. It's the work of somebody who belongs in the tradition of the great satirists, the great caricaturists. Um, you would place him, I think, in, in the tradition of um, George Gross, uh, Daumier, um, the feeling that uh, figures who expect to be admired, expect to be seen as personifications of authority, rule makers, uh, can be caught with their trousers down, can be revealed as just as horny as the rest of us. I think he sees religion as a great enemy, really. I think he sees it as one of the forces that conspire to destroy a natural understanding of and enjoyment of uh, life. Um, and you can see from these drawings how much he does in fact cherish the world um, and how much vitality he has within himself. It's obviously a vitality that enables him almost against all the odds to produce this body of work, which I have a suspicion might be quite prolific. The influences on Sahel's work are really quite complex, actually, uh, because the first time you look at them, you're very aware of the fact they seem to belong to a tradition not only in 20th century art, but earlier art, which is to do um, with overwhelming human tragedy. Um, it's to do really with a kind of apocalyptic tradition in Western art. And what I'm fascinated by is the fusion that one finds in Sahel's work, like an awful lot of other uh, Indian artists who have lived for a long time in this country. This fusion that they managed to arrive at between the Western sources of influence that I've already m talked about and a native tradition, because I was also very aware of the whole feeling of, of Indian art when I looked at those drawings. Although there was a tremendous awareness of, of the West, at the same time, I began to see them uh, as latter-day examples, almost, of, of Indian miniature painting. Sahel is a classic example of neglect. I mean, here is a man who has been making this, this very mature body of work, which deserves serious attention. He hasn't received it up until now. He's only just beginning to receive it today. But all the same, it's still surprising and almost shocking to come across someone like this and to realize that he's simply not known at all uh, and that he hasn't received any of the kind of support that artists in this country might expect at some stage, at least, in their career to receive. Um, and you realize all over again, walking around an exhibition like that, of how manifestly unjust the system can be and how important it is to try and make sure that artists like Sahel are not neglected in this way because it is so grotesquely unfair and it really doesn't reflect in any way on the importance of their work. His own experiences and the country in which he grew up are crucial to an understanding of his work. Um, and it's clearly that they're, that they're about, very often, these pictures, they're about the experience of being torn, of being rent and divided, um, and of a feeling of helplessness. That's very clear. 
these figures don't seem to be able to do anything about their fate. Um, and they seem to be dominated uh, to an almost alarming extent by these relentless forces around them. Strangely enough, natural forces rather than human forces. You get the feeling that the, that the entire world has become hostile. And it's a world within which they can expect to receive no help whatsoever. I want to see a peaceful world, I want. I hate hypocritical people. I want to say goodbye to religion, this fictional thing which has been going so long since ages. It's, and it's not going so long because it's something good about it. It's because the bigger the lie, longer it takes to go. It lost very, very long. If you want to lie, lie big, huge lie, you know, it will last very, very long. In next week's Bandung File, we profile the black writer Kaz Phillips and go to Bradford to see how some of its citizens view the cricket test match between Pakistan and Britain. Thank you.